Our Gospel reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter. Hear the Word of God. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge and arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was a young pastor at my first appointment. Still learning the ropes, still having a little bit of that thinking that I knew all the answers. I didn't even know all the questions. But having had several studies that we'd offered and several me important meetings to find that only one or two folks were to show up out of a Bible study, maybe one person would come out. We'd have an important meeting and half the folks wouldn't be there. I kind of got a little fired up. And one Sunday, I kind of let loose. I preached a sermon about priorities and commitments. It was one of these I was sure afterwards there would be a price to pay. But I talked about, you know, you make the time to do the things that are important to you, don't we? We all have 24 hours in one day. And I talked about how many of us were overcommitted to the wrong things, which didn't leave enough time for the commitments to the right thing. I really laid it on hot and heavy. After the service, I was standing in the entryway greeting folks as they left. And my chairman of finance came up to me and he said, Pastor, let me tell you, that was a really good sermon. <clears throat> we needed to hear that. That was, that was something we really needed to hear. And, and I know we have our finance meeting Tuesday evening, but I needed to tell you, my tee off time is at five o'clock. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure I'll be back in time for the start of the meeting, but I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> and the next man in line behind him, when he got to me, just looked me in the eye and said, Do you ever wonder if anybody's even listening? <laughs> and I said, Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is teaching his disciples in the crowd. He's talking, warning about against hypocrisy. He warns about fearing and valuing more what humanity thinks about you than what God thinks about you. He speaks about an unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, about trusting God when you're on trial, knowing that he will work in and through you. And suddenly someone in the crowd speaks up and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And I'm sure the disciples must have looked at each other and said, you ever wonder if anyone's even listening? <laughs> he goes on to talk about the dangers of prosperity. In our society, who's honored more? Poor giving widows or rich fools? Who's on the cover of the latest Christian magazines, radio talk shows, board of directors, ministries? Poor giving widows or rich fools? Oftentimes, our problem is simply that Jesus is trying to speak to us and we're not listening. Did you hear that? Point one, oftentimes our problem is Jesus is trying to speak to us and we're not listening. We're not paying attention. We're focused on other far less important things. We approach God with our agenda rather than listening for his 
Jesus is teaching about some very important things, and a man in the crowd says, Hey, teacher, I need you to talk to my brother about making sure I get my inheritance. <laughs> Maybe the first point we can learn from this passage is never mind asking, are you listening? The issue of this man's inheritance was so important to him, he didn't hear a word Jesus was saying about the important issues of life. Before you ask, listen. Secondly, note the man's request. Oh, wait a minute, that's right. He doesn't make a request. He doesn't say, teacher, I have this problem, what should I do? He doesn't say, teacher, how should I respond in this situation? He doesn't say, teacher, I need your wisdom and direction. He doesn't ask, he tells Jesus what he wants him to do. Thank heavens we're never guilty of such a thing. Right? Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I mean, we would never approach the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and presume to tell him what we think he needs to do, would we? Without bothering to pay attention to what he's already saying to us, we would never be guilty of that, would we? Dare we presume to tell God what to do when we aren't even bothering to pay attention to what he's been saying to us? If we claim to be servants of Christ, I, I need your help on this. If we claim to be servants of Christ, what direction is this, let me tell you what I want you to do conversation supposed to take? Is it, Lord, let me tell you what I think you need to do Or is it listening as God says, let me tell you what I want you to do? Which do you think is more appropriate? By the way, the man doesn't need Jesus to clarify the appropriate process for dealing with or dividing an inheritance. The guidelines governing this were clearly laid down in the Old Testament scriptures. Deuteronomy 21 says there's a double portion of inheritance for the firstborn son. If there are two sons, the elder receives two-thirds, and the second son one-third. If there's three sons, the elder gets two-fourths, and the others receive one-fourth each. If there's four sons, the elder receives... It's all mapped out. It's all laid out. It's there. There were rules and guidelines governing this. In Numbers 27, it lays down the, the line of inheritance, son, daughter, brother, uncle, nearest kinsman. That's all, he doesn't need Jesus to intervene, but he wants Jesus to intervene. This is what's high on his agenda, never mind what's high on Jesus' agenda. So in the midst of this, Jesus is always looking for teachable moments. I love, you know, the, the crowds get caught up in the miracles Often the gospel writers refer to them as the signs. They are the illustrations to back up what he's teaching. Or after this sign, he will follow up with the teaching. They're the children's moments, the object lessons, if you will. So a man brings up the issue about inheritance and not getting what he feels is his and ring. And so Jesus decides to issue a warning about the dangers of prosperity. Do you know that prosperity is dangerous? You know that? And he tells a parable to illustrate his point. He says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. There is an entire sermon in that verse. Isn't there? A sermon that our materialistic culture desperately needs to take to heart. In the old musical Fiddler on the Roof, do you remember this guy, Tenya? He's a poor Jewish farmer in, in Russia before a time in which the, the Jews would be driven out. And he sings a song about if I were a rich man. 
And it opens with these words. He's struggling to get by. His horse is coming up lame. He has to have the horse to take his milk to the village where he sells it to the villagers to make what meager income he can. So he begins his, his prayer by saying, Dear God, you made many, many poor people. And I realize, of course, it's no shame to be poor. But it's no great honor either. So would it have been so terrible if I had a small fortune? And he goes on to say, if I were a rich man, and he talks about whatever, it means I wouldn't have to work hard. He says, I'd build a big tall house with rooms by the dozen in the middle of town with a fine tin roof and wooden floors. There'd be one long staircase only going up and one long staircase only coming down. And one more leading nowhere, just for show. He talks about he'd fill his yards with chickens and turkeys and geese and ducks. He talks about how his wife would live as the wife of a wealthy man with a proper double chin, supervising meals, putting on air, strutting like a peacock, screaming at the servants days and nights. Then he says, the most important men in town would come to fawn on me. They would ask me to advise them, like Solomon the Wise. If you please, Rabtevia, pardon me, Rabtevia, posing problems that would cross a rabbi's eyes, and it wouldn't make one bit of difference if I answered right or wrong. Because when you're rich, they think you really know. We live in a culture that looks at the dream of when we make it big, when we get rich, when we finally achieve. You see, there's an inherent danger in having, wanting, possessing things. In the midst of material blessing, we can too easily lose sight of God, forget God, the source of every gift. What's more, you can become possessed by your possessions. One commentator puts it this way, the issue here is not ownership of possessions, but ownership by possessions. Wealth is a hard taskmaster. The person who desires wealth is tempted to make its acquisition top priority. The person who has wealth is tempted to devote his or her life to guarding and growing it. We're all tempted to believe that we can find true security in wealth. Faith in wealth crowds out faith in God. It's not money that's the problem, but the love of money as we're reminded in 1 Timothy 6.10. So to illustrate his teaching, warning against material focus, Jesus tells a parable. You know what a parable is. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. This guy is well off when the story begins. And he has a bumper crop year. That's what every farmer hopes for. That, that doesn't happen very often. You may have three or four years that are all losses. And then he says, what will I do? I don't have any place to store all of this. Now, let me mention what's intriguing in this passage. It never says it's wrong that the man's wealthy. It never says it's wrong that he... Uh, has all this wealth that he, he owns so much. But you'll notice, tell me where God is ever mentioned in this story. He's not. God's more of an interruption to the story. Thinking merely within the worldly sphere, the guy goes, I know what I'll do. My barns aren't big enough. I'll tear them down. I'll then build bigger barns. And then I can store it up and I'm ready. I got my retirement. My pension's locked in. I can sit back and I can enjoy life. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And here's the interruption. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you, and then, who will get what you've prepared for yourself? It's intriguing. There's no reference in the story to how might I use this for the kingdom. What does God want me to do with it? How can I help someone else? It's just, I'll store it up and I'll be fine. 
Jesus states the moral of the story. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. There's a couple points to this parable. One, we're not to devote our lives to the gathering and accumulating of wealth or stuff. If money is your master, that means God is not. Matthew chapter 6. Second point is that we're not blessed by God to hoard our wealth to ourselves. We're blessed to be a blessing in the lives of others. I want you to, to know, excuse me, I am battling allergies this morning. A prayer that I pray for my grown children every day is God watch over, protect, and guide them and bless them that they might be a blessing to someone else. We're blessed to be a blessing in the lives of others. We are blessed to help build up the kingdom of God. The Bible says if our riches increase, we're not to set our hearts upon them. Psalm 39.6 says, Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom in vain. They rush about heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. Psalm 49.10, For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. There's an old Greek proverb that says, Fools live poor to die rich. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths, or in, on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your treasure? Jesus also said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Years ago, I remember hearing a story about a, a supposed gate into the city of Jerusalem. That was a narrow gate, they called it the eye of the needle, and then whenever uh, travelers would come, they would have to unload all their baggage, draw their camel to fit. It's a great illustration. The only problem is, we don't know that there's really any such gate. Here's the bottom line. Here's the problem, I think. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for something as big and lumpy and overgrown as a camel to fit through than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom because there's so much danger in prosperity. We get attached to stuff. Stuff gets attached to us. We start dragging a lot along with us. Read the statistics. One of the, one of the booming businesses in America is storage lockers. <laughs> I confess, we ran one. <laughs> to hang on to stuff that we don't have room for. What are you storing up and for whom? You know, when I <clears throat> was preparing to move to St. Clairsville, one of the things I did for 30 some years, I had kept a paper copy of every sermon I'd ever preached. Think of that. You know what a banana box is? It, it, I had about eight of those filled with sermons that I'd lugged with me from church to church to church. And never, and finally I thought, why am I doing this? What do I, my kids don't care. I kick off, they're having a bonfire. <laughs> so I thought, I'm just gonna burn them. There'll be eight less boxes to drag along. It took me three hours. Paper takes a long time. How many other things do we lug along with us? What are you storing up and for whom? How are you making use of the abundance, the overflow that God has given you above and beyond your basic needs? Most all of us in this room would have to say we all have more than what we basically need. Before you consider possible investments or how to spend it or how to set it back for down the road or what new toy or trip or trinket to acquire with it, have you even thought to ask God, Lord, you've provided this. What do you want me to do with it? How might I use it to invest in your kingdom? What would you have me do? 
Because if you don't stop to think about that, be careful that you don't become a fool. Because Jesus says the one who thinks just about their welfare and what they're going to do on this earth is a fool. Because there's so much more. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And there's all sorts. By the way, you don't have to be abundantly wealthy to be greedy. You don't have to be abundantly wealthy to be overattached to things. Hoarding. How much is enough? Are you possessing or are you possessed? Are you looking only to your own wants, needs, and desires? Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Years ago I heard the saying that, that too often we love things and use people. And it's supposed to be the other way around. We're supposed to love people and use things. There used to be a bumper sticker, you remember saying it says, he who dies with the most toys wins. You remember that bumper sticker? I like the one that followed up that said, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> and they're not going with them. I was entrusted with sorting out my parents' estate. I wasn't the executor. But it was years had passed and we were trying to get it sorted out and the job fell to me and I had endless phone calls and visits back and forth with my siblings getting this all ironed out. It was all pretty laid out, pretty clear in the will, but that doesn't mean that it was all easy conversations. And I remember I got to a point of frustration where my children were home one day at our house and I just had a phone call with one sibling who was raising a ruckus over something. I remember looking at my daughter and son who were there and said, I, I, come here, I want to show you something. I took them over to the drawer and I took out a pack of matches. I said, if something happens to me, everything's mom's. Something happens to mom, everything. If something happens to the two of us, everything, everything. Split three ways among our children. Three ways, equally. No fighting, no, that my daughter went, dad. Come on, we, I said, listen to me. Everything will go on among the three of you. And if any one of you raises a ruckus, I want one of you to take these matches and burn the house to the ground. <laughs> it's not about stuff, is it? All the things you've prepared, all the things you've stored away, all the things that you've collected, all the things that you've invested and set aside, when God calls you home, whose will they be? And will you be around to really care or notice? As the bumper sticker says, he who dies with the most toys still dies. Don't be a fool. Remember where your treasure lies. Let's pray. Father God, hear our prayers. Help us to hear your whisper echoed in the Holy Word. Father, we like things Yet, we need to be reminded that some of the most precious and valuable things on this earth cannot be weighed or measured or invested in an account. All those things will fade and pass away. Set our eyes on your kingdom. May we ask ourselves how you would Call us to use and apply what you've entrusted to us towards an eternal investment. Give us wisdom. Don't allow us to become possessing fools. We ask it in the name of Christ our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Amen. I chose our closing hymn because I want us to remember where our treasure lies. The true treasure that moth and rust and thief can't touch. It lies.
Christ and the kingdom of God. Would you stand with me as together we sing the hymn, Victory in Jesus.